Hi, Dean. Morning, morning, morning. You want to try and uh, share your slides there? But uh, we check there are no technical switch glitches. Hi, Dean. Can, can you hear us? You're muted. We, we can't hear you, Dean. <laughs> oh, oh. Technical difficulties immediately. Yeah, let me see if I can unmute. Here we go, he's unmuted. Dean. Dean, hi, hi, you are unmuted. There we go. Can hear him now. You wanna try and share your slides, so long. I was gonna write in the chat. Can you hear us, Dean? I thought I had him there for a second. Okay, Dean, we can hear that. Yes, I can. Yeah, sorry, I can hear. There we go. Good. Yeah. Uh, let's try the next step. Can you share the slides? Are you able to? Uh, I'm going to try right now. Let me see. sharing that one. Can you see the slides? There we go. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce you, Dean, and I'll hand it over to you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another general club. So last week, we had Prof. Adrian Tordiff, who is the supervisor of Dean. He told us all about cheetahs, specifically captive cheetahs, and gastritis is a big problem in captive cheetahs. Catherine, one of her students, talked about how they use glycine as a supplementation to try and help them. And the other identified some help and identified lots of questions and further research is needed. And you know, Dean is one of the students of Prof. Adrian who's done additional research. 
And he's going to share with us some of his MSc on this topic. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Dean. Go yes. for it. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Uh, yeah, so this is basically uh, my MSc work that I just summarized. And yeah, hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, so it's H1, well, the title is H1 Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy or NMR Analysis of Urine and Serum to Determine Metabolic Markers of Lymphoplasma Cytic Gastritis in Captive Cheetahs, uh, their genus and species name, Asinonyx chubatus. And my supervisor was Prof. Adrian Tordov, as you mentioned. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Sorry, my laptop is just a little slow. Uh, okay, so cheetahs are a vulnerable species as indicated um, on the Interna International Union for Conservation of Nature or IUCN um, uh, red list. Survival threats uh, that the cheetahs face in the wild are agriculture and aquaculture, transportation and service corridors, biological resource use, human intrusions and disturbances, invasive and other problematic species, genetics, diseases, and source sink dynamics. Uh, the decline of wild populations in Africa is due to changes in land tenure, large scale fencing, land grabs, and political instability. The general threat to cheetah sub subpopulations in Eastern and Western Africa is, that, is thus habitat loss and fragmentation. Um, so in captivity, uh, cheetahs, face uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, the first of which is um, uh, breeding uh, challenges it's because it has been very difficult to breed captive cheetahs um, due to poor comprehension of the complex reproductive physiology of cheetahs. And, but successful assisted reproduction has um, like been achieved, but it's been tougher to achieve it in um, big cat species and these challenges Challenges have also been attributed to physiological factors. During 1992 to 2003, 15 cheetah pregnancies have, um, have been uh, achieved. But after 2003, um, there, was, there were no more pregnancies achieved. And the reasons as to why are not known. Um, cheetah cub, cubs have been born from in vitro fertilization, or IVF. And embryo transfer, um, well, some progress has been made. Uh, with embryo transfer, but more is still required uh, if the populations are to be maintained in captivity. Um, but apart from that, uh, there are also other difficulties that captive populations face. And um, these are basically unusual diseases that only captive cheetahs uh, suffer from in, yeah, well, in captivity, but um, other like felids or captive captive felids and free-ranging cheetahs do not. So um, a few of these diseases are lymphoplasmocytic gastritis, and that's the one that uh, I was looking at in the study, glomerulosclerosis, hepatic venoocclusive disease or VOD, splenic myelolipomas, cardiac fibrosis, adrenal hyperplasia with lymphocytic depletion of the spleen, numerous idiopathic neurological disorders. Yeah. Uh, these unusual diseases, like I said, are common in captive cheetahs, but are un uncommon in other captive felids as well as free-ranging cheetahs. Morbidity and mortality of captive adult individuals is significantly attributed to gastritis and renal failure. And most captive cheetahs develop gastritis at some point. So now we move on to the causes, um, or well, well, I mean, okay, what is uh, lymphoplasmocytic gastritis actually? So, Gastritis causes the gastric mucosa to become either acutely or chronically inflamed. And the reported characteristics of gastritis are lymphocyte and plasma cell invasion, invasion of the lamina propria and submucosa, epithelial cell and stomach gland death and ectasia, parietal cell shedding, mucosal hyperplasia, and mucosal ulcers. Features of severe gastritis are extensive ingress of lymphocytes and large amounts of plasma cells into the lamina propria and submucosa, which results in an enlarged lamina propria and abnormal tissue structures, distended glands, intraepithelial leukocytes, attenuation, death um, 
of epithelial cells and erosions and ulceration of the surface epithelial. So clinical signs of gastritis uh, include weight loss and anorexia, vomiting, suboptimal hair coats, emaciation, and perturbed growth. And that is um, also prevalent in moderate and severe cases. In severe cases, undigested meat is also, or has been observed in the, fe in the feces, uh, which is evidence of maldigestion. Based on histological findings, the prevalence of gastritis was found to be 100% in South African captive cheetahs. The prevalence of moderate to severe gastritis was found to be 64% in captive cheetahs in South Africa and North America combined, but only 3% of Namibian uh, wild cheetahs have um, severe or moderate gastritis. Thus, gastritis in captive cheetahs was determined to be omnipresent. 99% of these cheetahs were found to have gastritis of any severity. As I mentioned earlier, it's, like, it's um, omnipresent and only 11% of free-ranging individuals have gastritis. The mortality that was attributed um, to gastritis uh, and related diseases was 29% in American or North American captive cheetahs and 40% in South African captive cheetahs. In South African captive cheetahs, gastritis was the sole factor responsible for the death of 37% of in individuals. So it really is an emerging disease and it is noteworthy. Um, so yeah, then we get to the probable causes of lymphoplasmocytic gastritis. And uh, Prof. Tordov mentioned in the previous talk, the like three main uh, causes or like probable causes that the literature has basically covered, which is bacteria, diet, and stress. And I will just give a brief overview because uh, my literature review um, went about that but yeah uh, since he explained everything i won't go too into depth with that but so bacteria were suspected as a probable cause of lymphoplasmocytic gastritis because in humans chronic gastritis gastric adenocarcinoma peptic ulcer ulceration and lymphoma have all been linked to helicobacter pylori infections and it has been established that proton pump inhibitors and antibacterials uh, cure this type of gastritis However, in animals, helicobacter and helicobacter-like organisms have not been directly linked to gastritis. Um, in captive cheetahs, proton pump inhibitors and antibacterials have been used to treat gastritis, but only short-term relief from gastritis and helicobacter infections have been found. Furthermore, no cytotoxin-associated A gene, uh, which is the pathogenicity gene of helicobacter, has been found. In conjunction to this, the same bacterial strains have been found in diseased and non-diseased animals, and helicobacter is omnipresent in wild cheetahs, but no gastritis occurs. Thus, helicobacter is seen more as a commensal organism in cheetahs. So another factor, as I mentioned, um, that has been suspected for its involvement in gastritis is diet. Initially, the diets of captive and wild cheetahs were thought to align, but it has now been established that diets of captive and wild cheetahs are in fact different. Markers indicative of gastrointestinal disease were found to be epidemiologically associated with diet and a significant reduction in the risk of developing chronic gastritis and nonspecific GI disease was found when muscle meat was fed more than once a week. Um, but this protective effect um, or reduction in the risk um, is basically attributed to the extra, extra animal fiber that was included in the diet. Fecal biomarkers of inflammation increased on a beef diet in contrast to a whole carcass rabbit diet. Endogenously, endogenously synthesized and undigested amino acids are fermented in the colon by bacteria, and these bacteria produce putrefactive molecules. In humans, links between putrefactive compounds and chronic inflammatory uh, diseases of the intestines have been established. But um, animal fiber, though, includes tissues that are not entirely digested, such as skin, bone, and cartilage. It is thought that animal tissue that is not well digested has positive effects on the gastrointestinal um, microbial environment, but influencing, well, by influencing motility, absorption, uh, gastric emptying, and microbial fermentation activity. Animal fiber might be responsible for, epi for the epidemiological relationship between the feeding of carcass components and the decreased vomiting and diarrhea that is seen, um, which are symptoms of unidentified gastrointestinal disease. 
Now, fatty acids were another dietary factor that was suspected to contribute to gastritis development. However, it has been found that the N6 um, or, or and the N3 polyunsaturated fat, uh, fatty acids or PUFA, PUFAs um, or PUFA ratios did not differ significantly between wild and captive cheetahs. But thus, is it, it is unlikely, uh, and N3 PUFA ratios influence gastritis. Um, but it has been postulated that an increased antioxidant burden could arise as a result of the increased amount of peroxidized fatty acids that captive cheetahs are exposed to via their diet. And these fatty acids occur because PUFAs really undergo oxidation due to the presence of unsaturated bonds, or numerous unsaturated bonds. And carcass meat is also stored for some time before it is fed to captive cheetahs. Therefore, this is likely. PUFA oxidation can cause oxidative stress and inflammation if large amounts of these metabolites are, are present in humans, but it is not known if, these, if this is also the case in cheetahs. Lastly, dietary fiber was investigated, but uh, there was no significant influence on gastritis development found. Okay. So then from the literature, stress also seems like a noteworthy factor to investigate because they are morphologic as well as functional indicators of stress in captive cheetahs, which indicates that chronic stress affects them. This suggests that, yeah, that they are chronically stressed and stress may be linked to gastritis. However, causation has not been established and stress might be involved in gastritis development or vice versa. Um, it's only been like the stress is only indirectly linked so far because in captive cheetahs, there were only indicators, like I mentioned, of stress, and these were adrenal gland weights and, and adrenal cortical, cortical medullary ratios. They were increased, but it's not uh, established as such if it's due to stress or not. Um, and in fact, anecdotal accounts and experiences reveal that cheetahs are readily tamed and submissive in captivity. And indeed, cheetahs have been pets as well as hunting accomplices of humans throughout history. This would suggest that they are not stressed in captivity. Then there are other factors that um, I do not think uh, cause gastritis, but they could possibly contribute to gastritis. Um, from the literature, these are uh, parasitic infections, um, age, sex, and genetic factors. And the evidence suggests that age might be involved in gastritis um, progression uh, and sex influence the risk of chronic gastritis development as females had a higher risk of developing gastritis. Parasitic infections and genetic factors do not significantly contribute to gastritis development though. Okay, so why did I choose, or why did we choose metabolomics for the current study? Um, this is simply because the standard serum biochemistry and hematology tests do not reveal consistent differences between affected and unaffected individuals. Thus, we used a metabolomics approach to analyze serum and urine metabolites. So what is met metabolomics? So it is a comprehensive analysis in which all the metabolites of a biological system are identified and quantified. The meta metabolome is the total amount of metabolites of a cell, tissue, or organism, and is influenced by extrinsic factors such as disease and toxin exposure. The goal of metabolomics then is to obtain fingerprints of the biochemical mechanisms that are at work that have diagnostic or other grouping utility, or to provide an over overall metabolomic picture. Um, there are a few metabolomic platforms, and these can be divided into five common categories. These are gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, spectrometry or GCMS, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, LCMS, mass spectrometry, MS, and nuclear magnetic resonance, um, spectroscopy, NMR. But then you also get integrated applications. Um, and furthermore, very few metabolomic studies have been done in non-domestic fields to characterize this disease. This study was actually the first to use NMR to investigate disease in captive cheetahs. So the aims of the study were to evaluate the metabolic changes associated with lymphoplasmocytic gastritis in cheetahs and to determine if any urine or serum metabolites can be used as novel biomarkers of uh, this disease using an untargeted metabolomics approach. Okay. Then the experimental design is as follows. 
Urine and serum samples, as well as gastric biopsies, were taken from 85 captive cheetahs from the Africa Foundation near um, Otiwarongo in Namibia. And then 77 serum and 70 urine samples were analyzed by H1 nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy at the Northwest University. The gastric biopsies were assessed and graded by Prof. Emily Mitchell. Um, she's a specialist uh, veterinary pathologist at the National Zoological Gardens. And this was done via standard histological techniques. The biopsies were graded and scored on a scale of zero to three, um, zero indicating healthy cheetahs, one being um, cheetahs that have mild gastritis, two being moderate, moderate gastritis, and three being severe gastritis. But then the, we grouped the cheetahs in three groups for statistical analysis. Group one was the healthy group, and these, uh, this group contained cheetahs that were healthy and those that had mild uh, gastritis. This was done because the mild gastritis was really mild, and um, to make sure that the groups were comparable for stat statistical analysis. Uh, then group two consisted of cheetahs that had moderate gastritis, and group three, uh, the cheetahs that had severe gastritis. Then the raw NMR data was imported into R, and the ASICS algorithm or um, uh, automatic statistical, um, yeah, it's sorry, the acronym is somewhere, but it's, uh, yeah, automatic statistical identification in complex spectra um, was used to obtain relative concentration data for the serum and urine metabolites, respectively. The concentration data was then uploaded into Metabol Analyst and the multivariate statistical analyses were then carry out, carried out. Following this, uh, univariate statistical analyses were also carried out to supplement these results. Okay, and then some of the most abundant serum metabolites are indicated above, but I did not really look into those because um, I was more focused on the ones that uh, we actually found that were significantly different. And the PCA and PLSDA plots of the serum samples do not show significant uh, group separation, and thus the gastritis groups were found not to be significantly different. The PLSDA plot does show some group separation, but it could not be validated. Um, then some of the most abundant urine metabolites are also indicated here, and the <clears throat> um, no significant group separation was also found for the urine samples as indicated by the PCA and PLSDA plots. And this means that there were no significant differences between the groups. Once again, some group separation can be seen, but it could not be validated. In the 3D PCA scores plots of age and sex as cofactors for serum and urine samples respectively fail to show any significant interactions with gastritis severity. Thus, age and sex deem was deemed a non-significant factor for gastritis uh, development. Univariate, right. sorry, okay, that's the urine. Then univariate statistics were carried out to determine if there were any significant differences uh, between the healthy cheetahs and those that had severe gastritis. So we left the moderate gastritis group because they were in the middle of the two. Um, so the man with me U test uh, identified four serum metabolite um, metabolites whose concentrations were significantly elevated in cheetahs with severe gastritis in the, in the serum. Um, table two and uh, figure two show these differences. The elevated metabolites were 2-hydroxy isobutyric acid, pyruvic acid, dimethylamine, and citric acid. The same univariate statistics were carried out for urine samples and 10 urine metabolites whose concentrations were significantly reduced in the severe gastritis group uh, in comparison to that, or, yeah, were significantly reduced in the severe gastritis group in comparison to the healthy group. Uh, table four and figure, uh, figure four, uh, which show the box plots, um, uh, indicate these differences. Uh, univariate statistics for age and sex as cofactors for serum and urine samples respectively also did not uh, reveal any significant interactions, but these results are not shown here. Okay, so what are these? Oh, those are just more of the box plots. Okay, then what are these metabolites and why are they different? So 2-hydro, 
isobutyric acid or 2 HIVA is a bacterial fermentation product. Lysine 2 hydroxy isobutyrylation of proteins enables the functions of proteins to be controlled in eukaryotic as well as prokaryotic cells. Increased lysine 2 hydroxy isobutyrylation of mitochondrial proteins uh, means that it plays a role in energy um, metabolism or metabolic pathways. The increase in 2 HIPAA concentration is most likely due to increased bacterial fermentation of nutrients in the guts of cheetahs. Um, most of the, or all of these are basically, it's just, I say most likely or probably because um, there uh, more studies would need to be done to uh, definitively say whether these bacteria actually do this, but this is the most likely from the literature and from what we, we've seen. Um, yeah, then pyruvic acid, citric um, acid, transacrinitic and melonic acid or melanol CoA as it, um, as it is in the cytoplasm are metabolites that are involved in glycolysis, the tricarboxylic acid or TCA cycle and fatty acid biosynthesis. The likely reason for the differences in concentrations of the metabolites is due to uh, acunitase activity being inhibited by 2-hydroxyisobutyryl Relation, leading to elevated citric acid levels. Uh, the pyruvic acid concentration is subsequently elevated because glycolysis is unhindered, but pyruvic acid cannot enter the TCA cycle. Transacrinitic acid levels are reduced because it is converted to cis-acrinitic acid for use in the TCA cycle, um, but the cis-acrinitic acid uh, levels stay the same. Um, that's why there has to be a flux uh, or assume that trans Acrinitic acid is being converted to cis acrinitic acid. Citric acid uh, activates de novo lipogenesis because citric acid activates the acetyl CoA uh, carboxylase or ACC enzymes, and citric acid is broken down to acetyl CoA, which is then a substrate for fatty acid synthesis. Malonic acid may be reduced um, due to it being utilized in malination events that are associated then with lipogenesis. Dimethylamine, or DMA, and trimethylamine, or TMA, are gut bacterial metabolites. TMA and trimethyl N oxide, or TMAO, are dietary components of DMA, and dietary components of TMA are lecithin, uh, choline, phosphatidyl, choline, betaine, and alcarnitine. Gut microbes produce TMA from these sources, and other gut microbes metabolize TMA and produce DMA and formaldehyde. The increased TMA and reduced TMA concentrations are probably due to increased gut bacterial conversion of TMA to DMA. Then L-carnitine, choline, and betaine. Uh, dietary choline forms betaine, and betaine is then converted to methionine. Methionine is combined with lysine to form L-carnitine, and carnitine plays a role in beta-oxidation of fatty acids, and it is a conditionally essential metabolite in grown kittens and diseased cats. The decreased concentrations of these metabolites could be attributed to the increased usage by gut bacteria, as all of these metabolites could be metabolized to TMA and then DMA. So it's all linked. Taurine comes from the diet of cats or from endogenous synthesis by methionine and cysteine, but this endogenous synthesis is inefficient in cats. Enterohepatic uh, circulation of taurine occurs in cats by the microflora in, in the intestine. And these microflora deconjugate bile acids and anaerobic bacteria metabolize taurine. The decrease in taurine concentration can likely be attributed to greater bacterial metabolism in the gut by hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. And this is congruent with greater taurine needs in cats that have bacterial overgrowth. Our lysine can be used for taurine biosynthesis, uh, protein peptide formation and glutathione production in cats. It can also be used uh, for pyruvic acid production and thus energy metabolism. Cysteine can be metabolized in the uh, colonic uh, epithelium to produce hydrogen sulfide, but bacterial metabolism can also produce hydrogen sulfide. Uh, thus, our cysteine, like taurine, may be metabolized in the gut by bacteria that generate hydrogen sulfide, and this may be the cause of, of the reduced concentrations observed. Then 2-propanol can be metabolized by sulfur, reducing bacteria 
and methanogenic bacteria. But it's not known if this if these types of bacteria are present in the gut. Um, but the decreased concentrations that we observe could be due to metabolism of methanogenic and uh, sulfur reducing bacteria in the gut. Then 4-hydroxyphenyl acetic acid or 4-HPA can be formed from gut bacteria and it can also be converted to 4-cresol. The decreased 4-HPA concentrations may be due to increased or decreased gut bacterial populations, but we are not sure as the related compounds could not be um, identified uh, in the spectra and more analyses would um, be needed to say if there's like increase of certain bacterial populations and a decrease of others. So parietal cells in the stomach generate hydrochloric acid or HCl, which is required for a low pH, which is less than two in the stomach. And the low pH is needed to promote food digestion. And it also kills bacteria that reside in food and, and it aids mineral absorption and also prevents large amounts of bacteria from colonizing the proximal regions of the small intestine. A decrease in HCl termed hypochlorhydria leads to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. SIBO likely in, is likely in cheetahs with gastritis because there is evidence of bacterial dysbiosis which is likely a result of hypochlorhydria due to parietal cell shedding, which is one of the characteristics of gastritis. Um, furthermore, undigested meat has also been found in the feces of cheetahs with severe gastritis. Fermentative, fermentative processes produce many of the bacterial metabolites that had elevated concentrations and bacterial metabolites are known to exert toxic effects on the gastrointestinal tract and these metabolites may aggravate gastritis. In conclusion, there are significant differences in the concentrations of serum and urine metabolites between cheetahs and uh, or with severe lymphoplasmocytic gastritis and healthy cheetahs as revealed by H1 NMR spectroscopy. Age and sex do not significantly affect gastritis severity. These findings suggest that maldigestion and malabsorption of nutrients as a consequence of severe gastritis result in SIBO, which subsequently leads to an intestinal microbial dysbiosis. Thus, the metabolic characteristics of severe lymphoplasmocytic gastritis were elucidated and potential biomarkers were identified. And those are just my references. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Dean. That's a lot of references you had there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. So to the audience, are there any questions for our speaker? Um, you can either type in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, Dean, I don't know if you want to share your email in the chat box. Um, uh, yeah. I know last week, Prof. Adrian shared his, um, his email on the slides. So anyone interested in collaborating on or giving an idea of what's going on here with these cheaters, but Hello. I think there's, oh, I think there's a very clear gut metabolism issue going on there. So fecal meta metabolomics is definitely something you have to look at. Yeah, that's true. Um, Yeah, there's, there's definitely something going on with the gut microbes. Um, but yeah, we would need to do more investigations because uh, like, as you can see, I also linked a lot of um, um, like literature to, or I found a lot of um, literature about, you know, like deficiencies, what, what, uh, what the deficiencies of certain things lead to in cats and that, and then um, maybe cheetahs and, and all that. But um it's not necessary. like you can't necessarily say that if you found something reduced in the urine or serum that it, they are deficient so you know that that makes it very difficult that's why we came up with this hypothesis and this is like the best that we could do with the current um research that, that we did and and the literature but there's not much in the literature about any of these things at all 
Oh, but certainly untargeted is uh, beginning and identifying hypotheses for future testing. So I think you've done that. Yeah, <laughs> we tried. What is next for Dean in this sort of research? So, well, I'm not currently engaged in this research, um, but I might be in the future uh, if there's a a nice project uh, for me but yeah like at the moment i'm doing something else i'm an intern at the uh, department of veterinary tropical diseases trying to get some practical work experience as well so in other words you're the one chasing the cheetahs <laughs> exactly <laughs> so are there any questions in the audience for our speaker I know Catherine is in the audience. Do you have any questions for Dean, Catherine? Oh, I think Catherine does not have any questions. <laughs> well, if there's no questions in the, uh, in the audience, Oh, no, she says, I think it was a great talk. It was a great talk. Well done, Dean. Thank you very much. Uh, it uh, took quite a bit of effort to condense everything down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, the, the challenge of uh, these talks. And it's good practice to do it in, the, in these journal clubs. But I wish you luck with your practical work. And hopefully in the future you do do your PhD. Thank you. I, yeah, I hope to do that uh, after I'm done with uh, my internship. Okay, thanks very much. Um, now to the rest of the, the group, we, we're not gonna have journal club next week because it is Women's Week next week. So happy Women's Day to all the women in our group. And we'll see you later in August. Okay, that's that's cool. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. Yeah,